Alrighty. Well, good afternoon on the Empty Skull Ranch. Oh, I said I was going to do a gun video, and here we go. We're getting started. We're going to do a little bit of some of the old moldy oldies here, which are my favorite, near and dear to my heart. I like the military surplus stuff, the stuff that used to be a hundred bucks on the shelf and now has uh, gone through the roof, literally. So, what we have here today for our viewing pleasure is, again, something near and dear to my heart, being a proud Finn, we have the Finnish Mosin Nagant. Not to be confused as a Mosin, because it really isn't a Mosin. This right here is a Mosin Nagant. That is the 9130 Russian, made by Ishevsk with the hex receiver. It is a 1923 example. So it would be the closest relative to the Finnish M39. I'll kind of touch upon the uh, evolution of the Mosin throughout the years and maybe make some comparisons with this guy here. So, as you can see, all the weapons are unloaded. Never store live weapons. And never aim your barrel at something that you don't intend to destroy. So, what we have here on the table is the M39 Mosin. So, looks pretty similar as a pistol grip. That one has a straight stock, but it didn't start here. It began as one of those rifles. So after the Finnish Civil War, there was a lot, a lot and lot of leftover Russian rifles. And Finland being a small country, we had to use what we had. And so, whereas the Mosin Nagant is a very reliable rifle, it doesn't so much excel in the accuracy range. So, we've decided to make them a little bit better. So, it started off with the Model 27 or M27 Mosin. Most famously known for Simohaya, which was one of the most successful snipers in modern war history with over 500 kills with the Finnish M27 Mosin the gun. So, then it went up to the M2830, or the M28, then the M2830. Which they changed the sight post a little bit, and um, actually, if we come over and we look at the table here, I can explain it a little bit better to you guys. So, what we have here is the M39, the final evolution of the Finnish Mosin. And these were used right up through, I think, the 70s. And I could be wrong, so I'm not stamping that as fact, but I could be wrong. So the M27 was kind of a humble, you know, not really many frills and thrills that were different from the Russian one. They still retained the straight stock that the Russian rifles had. And they still retained, of course, throughout the whole evolution, they retained the receiver. As you notice, this is a hex receiver. That's a hexagon shape. And these ones, mostly all Finnish Mosins are built on the hex receiver. We always recycled the receiver. But the striking dif difference is the barrels. Now, I think some of the barrels were made by SIG in the early stages and um, I know that a lot of them were made by VKT, which is, this rifle is a VKT. VKT is kind of a tongue twister. In Finnish, it is Valtio and Gveritehtis, which is the rifle works of the Commonwealth or, or the state's rifle manufacturer. So, Valtio and Gveritehtis. So, anyway, on the M27, they changed out the stocks a little bit. Like I said, kept that. But this little front brace here had these popsicle sticks that come down right here. Because they were trying to figure out how are we going to brace the barrel at the end of the stock. So they had those popsicle sticks because uh, these were known to wear out a little bit and then they'd get loose. And uh, so that was their answer to that. But in the M28 or M2830, those popsicle stick supports kind of disappeared and adopted this milled barrel cap. 
So you can see the intricacy and in how, you know, the costly production efforts to make one of these guys. It's got the hole for the uh, cleaner, the bayonet lug on the bottom. And they strayed away from this rat tail bayonet that they used on the Russian ones. But you can see just the friction and the, and the squeeze on the wood wasn't enough to ensure that it would stay. They also included this hole right here which the other end of this nut is threaded. So once you put this cap on there, it threads right in. So, and the barrel bands, obviously, they change from these stamped metal rings into this guy right here, which you can see the amount of workmanship that goes into making one of these guys. So that goes around here. Also with the iconic stays, the spring-loaded pieces right here that it slides over. It's got that on this one too right over here. The Russian ones have those stays on them as well. So the Russian ones relied on the spring of the ring, spring of the ring, and that stay to keep those in place. We, however, weren't satisfied with that and had to add the little screw there to tension it to get it nice and clamped down. Whereas the barrel is still happy and harmonious in there because it's clamping only on the wood, not against the barrel. So, and the sight, changed the m27 still used this roller coaster sight that was on the russian ones so the m27 still had this m28 they started with this this is a way more precise target um, acquisition it still has the old volley sights right there in case you really want to do those goofball long distance shots it's got the notch in it but for the most part 200 yards is probably your happy area right in here so basically very simple rifle and they also changed from the Russian single stage trigger to a more modern style two stage. So you can feel right here where it has a set right before the sear and then you bring it beyond the sear and that's when it releases the firing pin. I believe it uses rollers for this Yes, it does. They're on the other side. You can't really see them that well through here, but inside that hood, there are two little rollers. So once you get it right there, and then you bring it right beyond the sear, two stage trigger. So very nice feeling trigger for a Mosin. I mean, Mosins are what they are. They're very simple. Pins were very simplistic as well, but did want the finer things. So we changed out the barrels, changed out the stocks. We changed out the sights and kept only the receiver and the internal magazine are the only similarities between a Finnish M39 or the evolution of the Finn Mosin to the Russian Mosin. That is the only similarity is this internal magazine and the receiver itself. So, before I start sounding all textbooky over here and all that, I will get into some of the shooting just a little bit. If you're still with me, God bless you. So, what was I thinking here? Also wanted to throw out a couple little, uh, couple little fun facts, but uh, definitely uh, get the gist of it. And we're going to cut for a second, and I'm going to show you some pictures of some bayonets where they differ from the rat tail. I'll put some pictures of the Finnish style bayonets which were a little bit more of a knife style bayonet rather than just a stabbing instrument. So I'll put up some pictures and show you those and then we'll get to the assembly. All right, so we're gonna dive right into the reassembly so you can kind of see the meat and potatoes on how these guys operate. Oh, this guy's coming to visit. Oh, hey. Oh, anyway, uh, anyway, uh, now that uh, I'm back from that, that little quest. All right, let's go right into this. Also, I decided, might not put the little help of my cameraman there. I decided, with, might as well show you how unwieldy this guy is with the bayonet on there. So you can imagine a knife style bayonet would be more practical in the field as, you know, something to use around the camp or something to, you know, cut food with and other things use as a knife because fins and knives are synonymous go together like meat and potatoes steak and cheese and bacon and eggs and peas and carrots and jambalaya and shrimp 
But anyway, this is the length of this weapon. Could you imagine a situation like this in the woods, carrying one of these guys and going after your target? So the finished ones are considerably shorter. Not by much, but that little bit helps. And then with the bayonet undermounted on it, it's only gonna come out to about there. So, thought of a little bit of everything. I know the Russian ones later, the M44s and M38s, they ended up shortening their Mosin a little bit, but that's a whole other video for a whole other day. So anyway, let's go back into the re -assembly. So we got this right here. This barrel here has got a little bit of pitting there, which is a little bit unfortunate, but I can take care of that. So we're gonna take this here and this here, and you can see in this, that is where the barrel sits. I'm gonna thread the trigger right through there, put it in there, and you'll notice, well, you're not here to see it, but this is technically a floating barrel. You can slip something right underneath there for pretty much the whole length of it. It gets a little tight here, but these stocks were done with match shot ability. You know, maybe not sub MOA groups at 200 yards, but you know, pretty, it all depends on the shooter and how well you know your gun. So it sits in there and they were uh, definitely, um, a lot of the physics and all that were thought of at the time, you know, being the thirties, it was, uh, they had what they had, but they definitely uh, did take a lot of things into consideration that are present on modern rifles. So, we're gonna take this guy, thread it right underneath that hood, right over here. <clears throat> we got it nicely in there. None of this wood is really contacting that barrel in that whole length right there. So, we're gonna take this cap right here. I wanna make sure we put it on the right way over the sight. This, I believe, too, changed in the, uh, in the uh, M28 version as from the M27, I believe the M27 retained the Russian style sights and these dog-eared sights, which this rifle was lovingly referred to as the Pustikorva, which is a breed of Finnish Spitz. It's a Finnish dog with ears that stand up straight. So Pustikorva in Finnish means straight ears or standing up ears. So it was kind of lovingly nicknamed that. So we're gonna tighten this guy up right here. Keep in mind too, as we're tightening it, we're not gonna over torque it because it's just gonna be the pressure on the wood that keeps it in there, not pressure on the barrel. So, mate that clamp nicely and give it one little final twist. There we go. Now we're going to take this milled piece that I was explaining earlier and we are going to slide that right into here. So we're going to flip that hood right over that hinged element, which is a nice feature to have and thread this guy right through there. I know these assembly videos can get a little drawn out, so I'm going to kind of just hurry through it a little bit. but. Definitely want to mention again, the M27 with Simo Haya was, all right, we going again? Hey, you still going. All right, we'll stop it and I'll All right, all right so this guy's nice and tight. We don't want to over torque these things because it's only a small plane of thread that it has in there. And see, we still have this met here. We don't want to really squeeze the uh, stock too much. Because the more you squeeze it, the more it wears in, and then the more you're going to have to squeeze it, and eventually you're going to run out of squeeze. I hate when you run out of squeeze, especially when it's cheese. All right. All right. So, there we go. Nicely laid in there. And we can take this end now, and we are going to put this internal magazine back into it right there feel that nice positive interlock it's not going to slide to and fro put this guy in here lightly mock it up a little bit okay. 
and we gotta grab and take this guy, put it in up here. And that makes the internal magazine and trigger guard to the receiver. Definitely this rifle, it elevates the Mosin almost to a level, much like a Mauser or an Enfield, which are some of the renowned battle rifles. You know, Enfields are terrific rifles. Mausers are awesome. They kept that design throughout the years and even the most expensive hunting rifles employ the Mauser design. But this little guy right here can join their ranks just about with the finish improvements. I definitely don't want to sound like we're tooting our own horn or anything, but it is a nice rifle. Slide the bolt back in through here. You gotta pull the trigger back. Notice that the trigger has a interlock right here when you bring it down. And there's that two-stage action. See, there's right before the shot, and squeeze it, and then you release the sear. So, nice two-stage trigger. So, I'm gonna slide it in beyond that. Get it in there, make sure that she's going good. Now, we are reassembled, all except for the cleaning rod. Don't wanna forget that. An important element to any battle rifle. Some rifles had a short one, which they relied on you being out in the bush with your buddies so you can put your cleaning rods together and make one cleaning rod. This one gives you sufficient length to get your whole barrel swab. So, get that tucked in there nicely. And we have a completely reassembled M39 Mosin. So, without further ado, let's squeeze off a few rounds. All right, so, Trusting my reassembly skills because I uh, used to like to make Legos when I was a kid. So I trust that I reassembled this thing right. And uh, I'll just explain too that I have here some Bulgarian rounds, which I'm not going to fire. They're highly corrosive. They're from the 50s, but they are penetrator rounds, these guys. But the way this normally works, if you're in the field and you have pouches filled with these clips, Again, people call magazines clips, but these are clips. So that's uh, us gun guys, it drives us bananas when people call them, call magazines clips, because there are clips. And uh, so it's designed, you put the clip right in there, and then you press with your thumb, unloading five rounds into that internal box magazine. So I have some on here, it never ever works. And you also get a phenomenon known as rim lock because it is a rimmed cartridge. So if your next round is in front of this round, it'll act like this. When the bolt's trying to push this round into the chamber, that rim interlocks right there. So it doesn't allow that, and you just see the rounds get pushed nose down inside of the receiver, it's real annoying. Then you gotta pop them all out and then start all over again. So when I load them in, I usually do them by hand because we're not getting chased down by enemies or anything like that. So push the first guy in, just like so. Slide it to the back. Push the second guy in, like so. Slide it to the back, making sure that you're not going on the rims. Slide it back. Slide it back. And slide it back. So, without further ado, make sure they got my eyes and ears on proper range safety. Safety first. All right, let's make this thing live. First, I'm going to give a shout out so I know we don't slay any hikers or anything like that that could be out there. Fire in the hole! All righty. Like I said before, we have tons of woods back there. I'm not concerned about it, but safety first. So you bring in your bolt, kick it down, and acquire your sight. I'm going to go just to the uh, ones on the barrel there. Let's see if we can get a couple of shots. And... This one can get a little sticky. Normally, since these bolts, the finished bolts tend to be very tight, a lot of the commanding officers would say, hey, grab 
some Russian bolts as soon as you get your first couple down because they're sloppier and they'll operate better in the cold weather. So, let's go for another shot. Two-stage trigger action. All right, with a resounding thud. This is definitely a rifle with a report. So let's see what else we All right, and we're also going to try this one out because we don't want to neglect the Sako. This uh, Seiko, Sako, however it's pronounced, but in Finnish it's Sako. And uh, so this one, you can tell it's got the gear with the S on it. I'll show you guys. Right there. And SA is for Suomen Armia, which is Finnish Army. So, but that is a 1941, this guy, 1941 wartime stock as well because you can see this splice is made with rounded fingers that's how you can tell a wartime stock so this stock is correct to the gun also made out of arctic birch if this got refinished down it would be absolutely stunning it would have tiger stripes <laughs> be beautiful i kind of like the pine tar you know all that stuff that was accurate to how these rifles were handled and it's a survivor like this. And it was probably carried during the Winter War or Continuation War, because not a lot of these saw the Winter War because that was in uh, 1940. I believe 41, it was already done. So it was the Continuation War that this saw action in. So also, I want to make sure we got our eyes and ears on. I'm going to give this a shot because that one was having a little bit of issue is I know that the trigger was kind of messed up on it. And every time I go to pull the trigger, you'd have to pull it a little bit beyond. So I gotta, gotta give that one uh, the empty skull ranch hospital visit. The guns get them too, not just me. So as you can see, I've staggered them in, no rim lock. This one, the bolt operates a lot smoother as well. This one is my baby. I like this one. You definitely got to manhandle these bolts. These rifles are meant to be treated rough. You can't gingerly pull the bolt back. You got to smash the thing up and smash it down. That's just the way they're meant to be. Just like so. Yank her back, jam her forward. So, Let's check out the target, see if I even hit anything. Ha ha ha! Oh, here we are down range.
range uh, didn't, you know, these targets aren't the most interactive targets. I gotta maybe go to the dollar store and get a bunch of bottles and uh, soda bottles. And that might make for a little bit better, better uh, TV, you know, you get to see something actually interact when the target is struck. So right here, without further ado, we got a couple hits right there. I was aiming for this guy. And we got two in there, we got two in here, nice 30 caliber hole, 7.62. One right up here, I was hoping that this thing would make a little bit more of a cling when you hit it. And then I went for the barrel a few times, it's hard to tell, this has been hit a few times, so no point in trying to point those out, but uh, hoping that we would get some kind of a noise down here of a cling or anything like that. But I promise we will get more interactive targets down here. But definitely an accurate shooter from freestand or however you choose. Some people, it's a heavy rifle. It's almost 10 pounds. It's, I think, 9-pound rifle. So some shooters might have to bench rest it because it can be a little bit, uh, little bit intimidating to some. But the kick and the recoil isn't too horrible. It's manageable. And speaking of, those rifles aren't the only finished thing on the range today. Except for me, of course. But... These boots here, I broke my foot the other day, so this thing's wrapped up tighter than a mummy, and it's inside of this World War II era finished jack boot. So this is also something that would have been worn by somebody carrying those rifles. So you can tell it's a Finnish one and not a German one by a very key point. I mean, they come up to the same height, but the Finnish ones feature this handy dandy Get my wrapped up foot so it's not right here is a ski binding these jack boots were also designed so that when you're out and about the finnish ski troops were feared by the russians and it was uh so you'd have your cup right here on the ski binding and then there's a cable that came back with a rubber interlock right there so you could hop right on skis while wearing your jack boots so let's do a couple more. Let's do a little bit more shooting. See if we can knock some stuff down and uh, give a little bit of give a little bit of this and a little bit of that. All right. These guys have pretty good muzzle flash as well. We're also going to look at a little bit of woods close quarters combat. These are rifles actually faced a lot of in the woods shooting during the Rate Road campaign and uh, a few others where they tried coming in and splitting the country up. So the Finns surrounded the Russian snake, they called it, cut it up into muttis. Mutti is a, uh, is a measure of firewood, but it's, uh, I believe, a cubic meter of firewood is a mutti. But they called it that because the troops, the train, they cut them into small segments and ambushed them while they were in the woods, all while carrying these. So it would have been kind of close quarters combat such as this. But with a broken foot and uh, all that jazz going on, let's see if I can uh, emulate what that would have been like. So we got one in the pipe, ready to go. So there they are. Well, this video is getting a little long-winded and uh, it's kind of, you know, don't want it to get too dull. So we're going to cut it right here and just figured I'd give you guys a quick overview on one of my favorite Mill Serp rifles. 
they're getting harder and harder to find. I do want to add an M2830 and a M27 to the collection just because it would make it a little bit more well-rounded. But in the meantime, stick around. Plenty more gun videos coming up, including some other external box magazine-fed guns. Whoa, scary. See you next time on the Empty Skull Ranch.